By his wounds, you have been healed. Amen. Our Bible reading this morning um, is Psalm 126, um, similar in some ways to, to Psalm 98 in that it's a short psalm, but one that really lifts the soul. Now, after that, while you're looking up Psalm 126, after that, you have noticed that we're going to have some gardening tips from Andy. And so for those of us who are suffering from withdrawal symptoms of not having gardeners world on the screen and um, we'll be looking forward to that um, but meantime psalm 126 let's let's read together god's word to us a song of ascents when the lord restored the fortunes of zion we were like those who dream then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. Please do have your Bibles open at Psalm 126. Ah, the good old days. Weren't things better back in the good old days? We've heard that before, haven't we? We've probably heard that more times than we like to before. In fact, on my granddad's 80th birthday, which is some years now, my great aunt, his sister, actually wrote and performed a song for the whole family about how things had changed and how things were far better back in the good old days. People were decent people back in the good old days. You could even leave your baby out in the street while she popped into the shop, apparently, back in the good old days. Petrol was far cheaper and energy prices far lower back in the good old days. And though it is true that nostalgia can play a trick on us and make out the good old days to be better than they really were, that like C.S. Lewis says as much in one of his essays, he talks about Wordsworth's famous poem about the daffodils on the hillside. And he says the reality is that if Wordsworth actually was to return to that moment that he's remembering in his mind, the chances are that that hillside that's fueled so many romantic thoughts for him actually wasn't quite as idyllic or as lovely as he remembers it to be. We could say similar things about the 1960s, couldn't we? That I'm sure many of you remember well and that often receives that label of the good old days. Though petrol was cheap and housing even cheaper and the world seemed so full of opportunities, if we were actually to step back into time I think you'd find that you still had to pay bills back in the 1960s. Crime still happened, and jobs were still just as tiring and frustrating. Those days probably weren't quite as good as many of you remember it to be, because nostalgia does have a habit of playing a bit of a trick on us. But nonetheless, I think it's objectively true, isn't it, that some periods in history are just far better than other periods in history. And vice versa, some periods are far worse than others. And the psalmist who wrote Psalm 126, well, he was living in the not so good old days. Hence why he asks the Lord to restore our fortunes in verse 4. Now, we don't have any context here, any detail whatsoever, but things seemingly weren't going well for him, and presumably things weren't going well for God's people either. And that lack of background, that lack of specificity to the psalm is really quite frustrating for a preacher. I'd love to be able to stand here and be able to tell you exactly what is happening at the time when the psalmist was writing, in what ways he and God's people were experiencing loss and sadness. But I can't, 
there's something very frustrating about not being able to do that. But there's also something really helpful about not being able to do that as well, where it means that we're not tempted to be too narrow with how we apply this psalm to our lives. It's true, isn't it, that there's often a temptation when we have a passage that is really specific and focused on one thing in particular, that those of us who aren't really going through that situation, we kind of tune out and say, well, this isn't really for me, or we feel like God is talking past us rather than through us, or rather than to us. But when you have no background at all, then you can kind of open things up a bit and allow the psalm to speak into every situation we find ourselves in when we're feeling lost or difficulty like the psalmist was. So we've established so far, haven't we, that the psalmist penned these words at a time where things weren't going well. The good old days seemed to be behind him and behind God's people. Perhaps they were facing a famine, which seems possible considering all the farming language that we get in the second half of the psalm. Perhaps they were facing military pressure from surrounding nations. Perhaps just seeing moral decline or gross apostasy in a nation. Like I said, we don't know. But what does the psalmist do in a discouraging time that he finds himself in? Is there a song that he can sing when he feels like the fortunes of God's people have been dashed? What can he do? Well, the first thing he does is to look back to the good old days, to look back at all God has done for his people in the past. And we see that in verses one to three. The psalmist here recognizes that his situation is not unique. This is not the first time God's people have felt up against it. Things had been bad for God's people before, verse one. The psalmist is looking back an event in the past where the Lord had restored the fortunes of Zion, his people. And for things to have been restored, well, they usually need to be ruined first, don't they? For example, I recently was doing some DIY around the house, and the job involved cutting some huge MDF sheets with a circular saw. I said, what's the worst that could happen? Surely an amateur DIYer like me can do this. Well, apparently a lot wrong can happen. Um, one, when you don't have a workbench, and two, when you're an amateur DIYer, and three, when instead of using a workbench, you decide just to rest this big MDF sheet on top of your four dining room chairs, which you'd managed to sneak past your wife without her noticing. Anyway, somehow, despite my high levels of care and diligence, we now have a dining room chair which has been pretty much sawn in half. Tara at the time might have said it was ruined, but since that moment, has now entered a period of restoration. Wood filler and paint do marvelous things. And at this point, you try not to catch eye contact with the actual good DIYers and carpenters in the congregation. But the point is, restoration can only follow ruin. So God's people must have been in a place of ruin before if the Lord had restored their fortunes. And again, we have no idea, do we, what moment in history the psalmist is remembering at this point. And we have no idea how the Lord turned that situation around and restored the fortunes of his people. Well, let's be honest, it's not hard, is it, to think of situations where God's people had looked to be facing certain ruin only for the Lord to step in and save the day. Those moments are a dime a dozen in the Bible. We think of the Israelite slaves in Egypt, in Egypt carrying crushing burdens, having their children called by the Egyptians, and later being trapped up against the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army bearing down upon them. They were in a desperate plight, weren't they? But God shows up at the last minute, the very last to save the day, splitting the waters, allowing his people to cross through on dry land and then bringing the waters crashing down their pursuers. God turned their sorrow into joy in just a moment. He turned harassed slaves into a nation in a matter of seconds. I think of the wilderness wanderings when God's people feared that they would die in the wilderness of hunger and thirst, only for God to miraculously provide for them everything that they need. 
Or think of Israel being crushed and subjugated by the Midianites or the Philistines, having all their food stolen away, some of their family being made slaves, living under the thumb of an oppressor, only for God to raise up judge after judge, rescuer after rescuer, to deliver them, to turn their fortunes around. That happened again and again, didn't it? I think of God's people in exile and Haman convincing King Ahasuerus to wipe all the Jews out. God's people faced certain extinction. So sure was that that they actually gathered themselves into houses and barricaded themselves in, fearful of all the power of Persia falling upon them. Only for God to raise up Mordecai and Esther and foil Haman's plan. The tables are turned and Haman is the one who finds himself killed, not God's people. I think of God's people returning to the land after many years in exile. God using a pagan king, King Cyrus, to do what seemed impossible, to get his people out of exile and back into the promised land. The list could go on and on and on. Periods where God's people looked like they were ruined, only for God to restore their fortunes. The psalmist could have any one of these events in his mind. But whichever one it was, when the psalmist looked back on that event, when God restored his people's fortunes, he says to him it was like being in dreamland. It was like a dream. Have you ever experienced something similar? Something has happened that is just beyond what you could possibly imagine? It just comes out the blue and it hits you and you're left absolutely astonished. It's like winning the lottery. Something amazing that leaves you feeling like you're walking on air. Perhaps you're still struggling to picture what that euphoric state might look like. If that's the case, then picture Alistair Shields at Hamden when Scotland qualified for their first major tournament in 20 years. I heard his voice the next day and I can assure you that boy was in dreamland the night before, as was our minister and I think many of the elders as well. You couldn't believe the turnaround in their fortunes, could you, when Scotland got into the, got into the Euro, Euros? It was beyond wildest expectations. Well, the psalmist remembers when something similar happened to him and God's people. He says, we were like those in a dream. The dark days were finally over. The good old days seemed to have finally begun for us. And they couldn't help but laugh and shout for joy and to sing. Verse 2. So enthralled were they with what God had done for them, they couldn't help but celebrate. And they can't help but tell everyone around them of what God had done for them. They have a song to sing before the watching world. They sing, the Lord has done great things for us. We want everyone to know this. We want everybody to know what the Lord has done for us. It's not too dissimilar, is it, to fans at a sporting event? Singing and chanting the name of their star player or the manager who has delivered success for them. They want everyone to know, the nations to know, the other teams to know what has been done for them and their team. And that's a good indicator, isn't it, of a heart that has been gripped by thankfulness when you can't help but tell others of what your Lord has done to you. But why does the psalmist take this trip down memory lane? Is it just so he can wistfully regale stories from better days to cast perhaps further gloom on the days that he's living in by lining up alongside those glory days and seeing how badly it compares. Some people like to do that, don't they? They kind of rub the salt into the wounds a bit. You think life is bad, they say, well, let me just make you feel even more depressed about the times you find yourself in as I compare it unfavorably with the best days of my life. It's not all that helpful, is it? We don't really want to hear that. We don't want to hear how house prices were so much lower back in the 1960s when we're having to fork out hundreds of thousands for hours. No, the psalmist doesn't cast his mind back to these times wistfully as a form of escapism, or neither does he do it to add insult to injury to make the days he lived in seem worse. But rather, he looks back to the days where God 
turned the people's fortunes around to remind himself of the kind of God that he worships. When life is rough, when church life is discouraging, I think we tend to develop the habit of going into tunnel vision. We can only see the situation we find ourselves in and nothing else, and as a result, we end up getting rather discouraged. We, are, we allow the situation we find ourselves in to teach us bad theology. Nobody is coming along to our outreach event, so we start thinking, well, well God mustn't save people anymore. Our church isn't growing, or perhaps worse, it's shrunk. We think, well, God mustn't care for his people. The church in the West is in decline. We say, well, perhaps God's just not willing to help his people anymore. Teenagers walk away from church and we say, well, perhaps this God isn't relevant anymore. Perhaps he's not powerful anymore. But when we look back at the past, we open up the scope of our vision and we realize that those thoughts that seem so convincing and soothe our miserable, self-pitying spirits are actually just a load of nonsense, aren't they? But God doesn't change. He is still the same. He, if he's restored the fortunes of his people countless times in the past, then surely he is still able to do it now and might be willing to do so. The Lord has done great things and he can do it again. That's why the psalmist goes down memory lane. And you know what? We have even more prime examples, don't we, than the psalmist to look back to. At times where God has restored the fortunes of his people, the psalmist didn't have a New Testament, did he? He hadn't read about the times where God rescued Peter from prison, or Paul from that matter, or how the gospel had spread all the way to Rome through persecution. God had turned the situation around. Or we can think of events more closer to our modern day. We think of the Great Awakening, the times of Whitfield and Edwards and the Wesleys, or revival in Wales and Lewis back in the day. The gospel breaking into China and rapidly spreading all through South America. Or even more recently, in our prayer meeting, we've been praying for uh, a lady called Charlene McCutcheon, who um, was on a ventilator. She was pregnant and was put on a ventilator after giving birth to a baby early. And she was very sick. The doctors came to her saying, there's actually nothing else we can do for you. Nothing at all. And Terry, her husband, turns to the doctor and says, well, I think now's the time for Charlene's God to turn up then. And he did. One day later, she's taken off a ventilator. Three days later, she's out of ITU, not just in the HCU ward, but back home with a baby. The Lord does great things. He's remarkable. Oh, we know a married couple at our old church who were told when, that their baby that was due to be born had a 50% chance of surviving birth. And if the baby did survive birth, and it was, the baby was guaranteed to have severe learning difficulties. The church prayed. She gave birth to a beautiful, healthy baby girl. Nothing wrong with her. Sorry, it's, it's just emotional when God does great things for his people. God does great things. And we, we need to relive these stories we need to relive these stories because they disperse the nonsense and the lies that we so easily believe about God and preach, to, and preach his truth to ourselves, don't they? God is for his people. God has done great things for his people, and he's capable of doing them again. So the psalmist cries out in verse 4. He says, restore our fortunes, our fortunes then, O Lord. I know you can do it again whether it's by a miraculous downpouring of your spirit from heaven or the slow grind of labor done in your name by your people, I ask you, please restore us. Here in verses four to six, the psalmist puts two manners of turnaround before us, the reader. One fast, uh, like streams welling up in the Negeb, and one much slower through sowing seed and waiting for the harvest. The Negev is the far southern region of Israel, and it's a really dry and arid place. 
not much grows there. And because of that, when a big storm hits the region, there's actually nothing to absorb the water at all. So the cracked ground quickly wells up and becomes ravines of rushing water. The psalmist is kind of picturing something of a flash flood here. And uh, I actually nearly got caught up in a flash flood when I was a teenager. It's quite a terrifying thing to do. It happened so suddenly. A friend and I, and I were cliff jumping in a river about 30 minutes from my house. Um, and whilst we were down in that ravine, we jumped in off the cliff. We noticed the water level just started to drop really suddenly as the water was drawn up the river. And I can tell you, you will not see me move so fast in your life. I was up and out that ravine in a matter of seconds because just moments later, there was this huge surge of water came down the ravine up 30 feet, up over the bridge that we were jumping off, it came. Uh, it was incredible to see. And the psalmist says, you know, the Lord, he can change a, a scenario just like that. He can change what the situation looks like just like that, as quickly as that, like streams in an edge, like a, a flash flood if he wants to. We know he can do that, like the great revivals of the past. But we also know, don't we, that God tends to act through secondary causes like us he enjoys involving us in our plans to bring about change like a father allowing his son to help out with his diy jobs although don't worry i kept simeon far away from the circular saw but god's not restricted to doing that is, it, is he he's not restricted to just using secondary means he can act directly if he wants to he could act directly upon our situation if he wanted to and transform it in an instant. He's done it before. But the psalmist, after talking about this instant situation, the streams welling up in the Negev, he then goes on to talk about um, the more usual means, the more regular means by which God works in his world. Through the tears and the labor of his people, verse 5 and 6. Sowing what little they have in faith, and praying that the Lord will bless their endeavors because that brings him much glory. That comes out in the first half of verse six. Some translations refer to the seed here as the precious seed, which it certainly would be, wouldn't it, in a time of famine. Picture for a moment just how glorified God must be when a family facing famine plants the few seeds that they have into the earth, trusting and praying to the Lord that he will bring fruit. That's what the widow of Zarephath did, didn't she, back in Elijah's day. She was about ready to cook her last meal and resign herself to death before Elijah appears. But then she puts what little she had in, on the line in faith. And God does not disappoint her, does he? So we too, we follow that example, and the example the psalmist here, we, we too sow what little we have, even through tears in the most difficult times that we ever find ourselves in. We trust all the resources that we have over to the Lord in faith. We send our invitations out to our friends and family to come along to our services or to Hope Explored. We teach our kids the Bible even when it's hard, even when it seems like they don't want to listen, even when we're tired and we want an early night. We drag the family out to church on a Sunday morning, even when some of us aren't willing. We baptize our babies, we serve in church, we forgo holidays and nicer houses because we give our money to the Lord, to the church. We pour our time and energies just into that grinding, everyday work of being a believer doing what God has called us to do, tilling the earth, planting the seed, and praying to the Lord that he might bring growth. Because we know he hasn't changed. And we know that he can turn our tears of sorrow into tears of joy, just like he has done many times before. And we're encouraged, aren't we, by verse 6? The ESV doesn't capture very well the Hebrew here, but in the Hebrew, this, it goes a bit more like this. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, 
shall surely, shall certainly come home with shouts of joy, bringing the sheaves with him. Surely, certainty. Those who put their precious seed in the ground, trusting the Lord, shall surely come home with joy and see the fruits of their labor. Now, please don't worry, I'm not going to start preaching the prosperity gospel here. Give that little bit that you have to the Lord in, in faith and he will certainly bless you now. That's not what I'm saying. The reality is that we often go about our daily life trusting ourselves and um, the most precious things we have over to the Lord, praying that he'll bring about fruit from our labor and by, from our efforts. But sometimes we don't get to see that, that fruit, do we? Sometimes despite our best efforts, one of our kids doesn't grow up believing and leaves the church. Sometimes, despite all our prayers and our most earnest attempts to take opportunities with family members, sometimes they don't come to know Jesus in the end. Sometimes churches don't prosper again, despite the faithful efforts of many. Sometimes our prayers don't get answered in the way we'd hope. We know families who have seen the Lord do remarkable things for them, like the friends I mentioned earlier. But we know many other friends who are just as faithful who didn't get to experience the same joy and delight that they did. But here's the crux of the matter. Nothing done in service of the Lord, no seed planted in trust, is ever, ever fruitless. We may see fortune soon and quickly, immediately, and we're right to long for that. We're right to pray like the psalmist does, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Nedeb, do it now, please, we pray, change our earthly circumstances. And sometimes we get to see some of those first fruits of those prayers here and now, and can join in the psalmist by saying, the Lord has done great things for us. Isn't he amazing? But sometimes the Lord asks us to wait a bit, wait until the final harvest, where all the ruin we face now will one day be fully restored never ever to be damaged again. There we will sing the psalmist song with even more gusto than we could ever sing in this life. The Lord has done great things for us. The thing is, we don't know what he'll do when we pray, do we? He could restore our fortunes in an instant, like streams in an edge, like a flash flood. He could bring restoration over a longer period, as his people graft and grind it out in faith, doing what he asks us to do every day. Or we might not see any turning point in our circumstances until that final day, the final harvest. But whatever he decides to do, it doesn't change what we do. We continue to do the same. We look back and we remind ourselves of what God has done in the past and the kind of God that we worship. We remind ourselves of that. And we look forward, knowing that he is able to do exactly the same thing again if he wills it. So we keep tilling the earth. We keep planting our precious seeds now. And we keep praying to the Lord that he'd bring fruit from our best efforts. Let's pray. Father God, when we look in our lives, we, we, we too can say the Lord has done great things for us. There are many things in our lives that we would love to change. Loved ones, we'd love to know you. Family situations, we'd like changed. All these things. But we can look back, not just at history and into, into the Bible and see all the things that you've done for your people, how you've restored their fortunes in the past. But we can look to our very own lives and we look and see what Christ has done for us. We thank you that you have opened up our eyes, that you have uh, made us your people, made us part of your family, giving us purpose and hope. And, and Father, we have to say that you've done great things for us. But Father, we pray that you'd give us a godly greed,
that you, we'd continue to come to you hungry, asking you to do great things for us, your people, to restore the parts of our lives that are ruined, to restore relationships and people that we care about, and to bring further restoration to our church that we might flourish and see fruit. So help us, we pray, whether it's in an instant thing like streams in the Negev or through the slow grind of time and faithfulness.